thank you very much, and uh, um, yeah, thank you for saving me. <laughs> so uh, yes, I will be speaking about this experiment we did uh, in uh, during parabolic flight. Um, basically, we had the opportunity to to, take, to participate to three parabolic flights organized by the uh, French Space Agency, and I did this experiment. Uh, together with some colleagues in, uh, uh, in German colleagues, uh, and also I uh, must uh, absolutely credit much of this work to my PhD student Elena Monti, who was uh, instrumental for gathering some of this data. So um, the question that we wanted to address was this. Um, of course, when we do a drop jump, and you all know what a drop jump, drop jump is, basically you stand from a platform, you fall on the ground, and then you jump off. During the landing phase, in preparation for the jump, you must forcibly pre-activate your muscles. If you don't pre-activate your muscles, you crash to the ground. Uh, of course, on Earth, there is no problem about this, because we do so uh, because we know what to expect. We, we have knowledge of gravity. So the question was, if we change gravity, how do we pre-activate our muscles? How much and how early? And of course, during a parabolic flight, we have a con continuous profile of gravity. And so we could test during the pod, uh, this, this uh, problem um, during uh, 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 various levels of g levels. So this is a typical uh, this is a typical drop jump. So the subject standing, then there is the flying phase. During the flying phase, it activates the muscle. It lands. Upon landing, uh, it breaks, and uh, uh, and then there is the jumping phase. During the breaking phase, the muscle is elongated. The tendon uh, then reaches an isometric contraction during which the tendon is stretched, and during the energy stored in the tendon is then released during the jump phase. So, uh, during the deactivation phase, the central nervous system must reactivate the lower limb muscles to stiffen the joints to generate a muscle contraction, aiding, uh, able to break the fall uh, upon the impact with the floor. During the landing phase, the CNS must, must fix the muscle length to, do, uh, to enable the tendon to be elongated. If the uh, muscle does not contract and does not reach an asymmetric contraction, it doesn't act as an anchor, it does not enable the tendon to be elongated. And the elongation of the tendon is useful because it, it is used to store the energy, elastic energy, into the tendon, and this elastic energy is then released during the push of phase. So we wanted to address two questions. How is muscle fascicle length regulated in preparation during landing and jumping in variable G levels? And then, in what portion of the sarcomere length tension relationship are fascicles operating during drop jumping and G levels? Just to <coughs> give you an idea of what uh, a parabolic uh, flight is, basically, you cover a distance from 5,000 5, to 8,500 meters. So you travel to an unknown G, then the plane pulls up at an angle of 45 degrees, and then it reaches the top of the parabola, and then descends again. Uh, from it, when it, um, the forward thrust is equal to the pull of gravity, uh, the net acceleration is zero. So you have about 20 seconds of zero g. The whole parabola lasts about 80 seconds. Uh, and during, the, if you have any doubts that there is, uh, that actually is, you actually fly in, in perhaps this little field will show if it works. Does it be here? There you go. During 30 seconds, you can see, you have absolutely no control of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, 
because there's no ground in your flyer code. So, um, we had, uh, as I said, we participated in three uh, parabolic flight campaigns uh, in three different days, and uh, in each flight, the plane does 30 parabolas, 30 to 33 parabolas. So you have many chances of performing your experiment. We had uh, um, two subjects per flight, and each subject performed 15 parabolas per flight. We had a total of 18, 18 subjects, and uh, uh, during a typical parabola, the subject does six jumps. So it does six jumps at different levels of gravity. So for a total of 90 drop jumps in per, per flight. We collected after some uh, this, uh, of the gastrocnemius medialis muscle by placing an ultrasound probe attached to the leg and this was very firmly dropped. The ultrasound was encased in a special cast to keep it there and the, the probe did not, did not move because we, made, we were filming with markers and we were sure that the probe would stay in position. Uh, they were, we were monitoring joint angles and we are measuring landing forces on force platforms. We also recorded uh, EMG tele telemetrically on seven muscles, the, the gastrocnemius medialis, lateralis, sonus, tibialis anterior, spastus lateralis, spastus medialis, and gluteus. This is a typical jump. As you see, the subject prepares for landing, lands and does the, uh, the following job. So, <coughs> we, um, when we came to analyze the, the uh, ultrasound images, basically we uh, analyzed 90 jumps for 15 parameters. And these were clustered into 9 gravity levels, uh, 0 to 0 0.25 g, uh, 0 0.25 to 0.5 g, 0 0.5 to 0 0.75 g, 0, 0 0.75 to 1 g, 1 g, and this was of course, this was hypergravity, this is normal gravity, and these were levels of hypergravity. And these are typical images obtained during the pre-activation phase, so as the subject is about to land, to, uh, to land this is upon ground contact, this is when the ankle reaches the minimal ankle, ankle joint, and this is the, uh, the push of face. These are uh, typical ultrasound images obtained on the gastrocnemius medialis, and these striations represent the fiber fascicles. Now, knowing the, fascic the fiber fascicle length, and knowing what is the length uh, from literature of the gastrocnemius medialis sarcomere uh, length, we were, we, were we were able to reconstruct the uh, sarcomere length tension relationship here. But before we look at this, let's consider first what were the changes in fascicle length during jumping in 1G. And this fascicle length expressed uh, uh, per uh, uh, resting length, so it is Fascicle length normalized for resting length. This is <coughs> before jumping, and this is during the pre-activation phase. So as the subject is flying, and uh, you can see that from rest to upon ground contact C GC, the fascicle was shortened by about 40%. Upon landing, you can see that the, 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 there is a, a quick uh, uh, move to, to an isometric contraction, so from here, to, from ground contact to, minimal, 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 to maximum ankle joint, the fascicles are behaving quasi isometrically. And this isometric phase is fundamental to enable the tendon to be stretched. And of course, this elastic energy then is then released during, during the shortening phase, uh, which ultimates with the uh, end of the push up phase. You, now, when, when we consider the, the sarcomere length in the sarcomere length force relationship, you can see that upon ground contact, 
the fascicles are very close to optimum length. As the fascicles contract, so as we move from, uh, from, from the beginning of the reactivation phase to the push-off phase, you can see that we go down from the left side of the length tension relationship, reaching very low starting length. You may wonder, you know, you know why uh, we are reaching such low sarcomy length? Because uh, normally we would expect this to interfere very much with muscle contraction. But actually, the force which is produced here uh, is, is very little produced by the muscle. It's mostly uh, a contribution of the elastic energy restitution by the, uh, by the tendon. Now, this is what happens uh, during 1G. Let's now consider what happens in zero in uh, hypogee, so at gravity levels below the one on Earth. So, with the exception of uh, the lowest uh, um, G levels, because here in this case you're flying too much, so you're never reaching if you want the, the force platform, you see that uh, in hypogee uh, the preactivation occurs earlier. Uh, it occurs earlier, but you're still able to reach the, um, the quasi-asymmetric phase uh, enabling the tendon stretch. But again, when we consider a length tension relationship, you can see that we are actually, fascicles are operating still in the ascending limb of the length force relationship, but um, there is a greater shortening of fascicles during the preactivation phase. And this is probably because we don't know what gravity will be like. So, just in, in this uncertainty, we decide to preactivate early, just in case. So, and so we start with a, a, a circumil level, a circumil length level, which is uh, actually shorter than the one on Earth. If we now consider the apogee, now the, the pattern is, is very distinct. We can, of course, when we land, in this case, the, the pull of gravity is very strong. And so the landing is followed by a very powerful eccentric contraction because we keep going down, breaking, and <clears throat> only when we finish breaking, we can achieve the isometric contraction. So you can see that there's a very fast shortening. Here there's breaking phase, and then it takes some time before you achieve the isometric phase. But you still achieve it. But interestingly, both in both in IPOG, sorry, both in IPOG and in IPOG, as in 1G, fascicles shorten to 40% for their initial length. Okay, and then we, when we consider the length force relationship, here the effect is even greater. Of course, they, uh, what is very noticeable here, uh, we start with uh, um, a, a certain length during the preactivation phase, which is well away from the, from the uh, optimal length. And this is because uh, the pull of gravity is so strong that even when you're standing on the force platform, you're contracting your muscle forcibly. And so, uh, you're starting with, uh, not from a resting position, but already from uh, uh, quite a strong contraction. So to uh, pull all this information together, I think we, there are various take-home messages. One, first of all, is that our uh, motor system is able to put in place effective strategies for safely landing in IPG and IPG, IPG, and it does so by anticipating the pre-activation phase in both conditions. And this pre-activation is greater in IPG as the muscle is loading occurs already when the subject is standing on the force part. However, regardless of the G levels, fascicles are still able to achieve the, the quasi uh, isometric phase, and this is essential, essential to enable the tendon stretch to store, uh, to store elastic energy to be used in the following job. And lastly, um, the, the fascicle behavior during drug jumping in IPG and IPG is similar to that found in locomotion, <coughs> where we can see that the changes in fascicle length and, and changes in tendon length, these are very similar to what we use during locomotion uh, and, and as well as running.
su suggesting that therefore that there is a natural wisdom uh, in the regulates possible in gravity condition different from those ones. So I'd like to end by thanking my collaborators, uh, both in Germany and of course in Padova. This is Angela Mont uh, uh, Elena Monti uh, in her spacesuit and uh, she was a brilliant uh, assistant and also a great flyer. Thank you very much. Would you send uh, some minimal information about this talk to the special issues of mass and fascia which will be published next summer or is too early? No, I think a uh, short communication we can certainly send, yes, no, no problem. I have 150, 40, 30 people saying that you said this. <laughs> He committed to it. I understand how exciting those experiments must have been to do. <laughs> but uh, would you have seen similar experiments with weighted jumping or reducing mass by having a spring to the ceiling? Well, um, you know, it's, it's different. It's different because um, you know here. Um, we could test many great, you know, uh, hypogravity levels. Yes. You know, to do the same on Earth, you'd have, you'd have to have uh, a series of elastic bands of different stiffness. Yes. Uh, you know, now we have analyzed all these uh, you know, nine levels of, of uh, you know, nine, nine gravitational levels. Uh, I say nine, but actually we can have many subtraction that we actually present. Uh, but the, no. But is it is it any different than jumping with a weight on your back? No, jumping with a weight on your back certainly it, yes, it's uh, you could do that to to study the effects of hypergy. Yes. But in hypergy, for hypergy, it's much more difficult. There is a fundamental difference. Ah, oh, sorry. Go ahead. One question. Just curious whether um, the getting to the optimal uh, sarcomere length during the face of the maximal force would mean uh, keeping the ground with a hill already in majority of the subjects or not? I mean, is our foot built not for hopping because we would touch the ground with a hill in case that we would be close to the peak of the sarcomere length to, to um, tension ratio? I mean relationship, because we were all the time on the short-term part, right? Well, the, the, of course, the, um, the gastronomias, from our experiment, also other people's experiments, Walter Herzog, for instance, is operating on the ascending link of the length force relationship. Um, the, the fact that the classicals shorten quite a lot, also maybe a strategy, to make sure, because you remember, you have to, you have to not only you're, you're jumping down, you're landing, but then you're jumping and falling again. So you have this excursion to, to uh, go through, also the second time. So uh, maybe one way, one reason why the fascicle shortens so much is that you have to go back. And if you go back, if you, if you shorten too much, if, if you shorten too little, you may end up in the other portion of the length force relationship. So you go past the, the plateau of the length force relationship. Yeah. So it, it may be a safe yeah. way to operate always in the same region to make sure that upon um, contraction you eventually reach the plateau of the contraction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Well, okay. there was any other questions? Yeah. Some other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yes.
Yeah, yeah that, that's a very good point. We, we did 33 parabolas, and uh, it looks as if there is a, a training effect. Not, in, not, in, not as much in terms of muscle behavior, but in terms of anticipation. And so we are uh, looking at the timing of the pre-activation, because it looks as if as the parabolas progress, there is a different effect in the timing of the activation. Thank you very much.